All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started with those of you that are here and ready to roll. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining Africa Fire Mission at today's weekly training. Today's instructor is Ed Collette. He'll be talking about um, auto extrication, and this is part one of a two-week built series. Uh, so excited about that. Just a reminder that our trainings are brought to you by volunteers. And so we're, we're very pleased to have um, our volunteers support these trainings. Uh, we do not include a certificate of attendance at this time for these trainings. Uh, the training is recorded, however, and will be available on AFN's YouTube channel for future viewing. Since this is a one hour training, we will start with the training and invite you to do introductions in the chat. Um, also, as we go through today, please make sure to um, mute your microphones as we go along, but you may also unmute yourself if you have questions or use the hand raise feature to ask questions. Um, after the training, Jose will host a tea time and you're invited to stay afterwards to um, talk or um, chat about the training. So um, with that, I'll pass it to Jose for a few words of encouragement. Super, thank you so much, Nancy. It's always uh, nice to be here. I'm happy to be back and uh, ready to roll. Thanks, Ed, Colette, for finding time to, to come and teach us about vehicle extrication. So today uh, we're going to jump into day number 11. Uh, as you know, we are in the uh, day 110, yeah? And uh, we are in the 90th day of encouragement. So I'll jump now to day number 11, and then we see what we have for today, yeah? So I'm, I'm getting the uh, 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 reading from uh, this 90 day of encouragement of a hole in your faith, and it is uh, for firefighters. Here goes, and I read. Meeting Jesus, day number 11, by Wayne Desler, international board member. But I know this, I was blind and now I can see. It comes from John chapter nine, verse 25. All his, li all his life, the man had, had seen nothing. Then he met Jesus and Jesus healed his blindness. The man's testimony is, a clear, is as clear as his newly acquired vision. These are very personal meaning to the statement of Jesus. I am the light of the world. That's in John chapter nine, verse five. When the man met Jesus, his whole life changed. Many years ago, we were in a chapel service at Wheaton College when a student cried out. It turned out that she had been virtually blind, but during that rather routine worship experience, Jesus healed her. After, after we meet Jesus, nothing is ever the same. And I finish. Yes, it's true. Actually, when you get to meet Jesus, nothing becomes the same, you know? And even in the fire service, when you actually have a relationship with Jesus Christ, even as you're in uh, serving uh, uh, God's people, you'll find that you, you can be capable of doing a lot of things. There's peace of mind that you have, and there is joy that comes along with it. So I encourage you, even as you are uh, serving in your firehouses, uh, or either you might be at home resting, consider having Jesus part of your life. That will change you, and it will change the way you do things. I will pray, and then we'll start. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for giving us yet another opportunity on a Wednesday evening to come and learn. And Lord, you've been providing teachers who come and teach us for free. Today you provided us this uh, teacher, a uh, trainer, Ed Collette, to train us on vehicle extrication. Lord Jesus, may we humble ourselves so that we can hear from Ed Collette that the information that he has for us. Please help us with our internet connection and also electricity and help us to get everything that we are taught. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ed Colette, the floor is yours. Please take, take us away. 
Okay, thank you, Jose. And thanks everyone thanks, for taking your time to uh, come attend this class. My name's Ed Cullett. I'm here in Ohio where there is snow on the ground, unfortunately, but we'll get over that. Uh, we'll talk about extrication. I am on the Jackson Township Fire Department and I am on our tower rescue company, which the purpose of our tower rescue company is mainly for rescue, which includes vehicle extrication and all technical rescue. And our tower is to do truck company operations on fire scenes. So we'll go through today. Uh, we've, I've got the class split into two parts. Today is going to be more of the preparation and looking at. We're not going to actually cover a whole lot of tactics today. Next week is going to be the tactical week where we're going to go through tactics to remove doors, tactics to remove roofs, how to move dashes. Today is going to be a lot of the foundational information. So with that, if all the electronics works, we'll be, go ahead and start our presentation. There we go. Is everything, Jose, can you just give me a thumbs up if we've got everything that looks like it's coming through? Looks good. Okay, that's what we need to know. Looks good. Okay, great. So here we go. Here's our overview for our class. Today we'll talk about the high level stuff that is our foundational information. You know, planning for extrication, the type of tools we have and how we're going to use them. Vehicle anatomy, it's very important. A lot of people overlook it. Just like in firefighting where we need to know the building types and construction of buildings, the same is very critical when we're doing vehicle extrication to know how to apply certain tactics. Scene size up, when we roll up, we don't just, just like we don't just run into a fire, we take a minute to look around and size up the scene. The same holds true for vehicle extrication. We don't just run up to a car. We take a little time to figure out what's going on with it. Um, scene, scene safety, you know, positioning the apparatus, traffic control, um, and kind of stabilization of the whole incident. Not necessarily stabilization of the car, but we might, if we have time, we'll get into that. If not, we'll roll into next week, where next week we talk about the actual tactics to remove the vehicle from around the patient. You know, we'll talk about it, the cars on its tires, you know, door removal, side removal, dash displacement, roof removal, tunneling in from the back of the car. Uh, when the car's on its side, your tactics change quite a bit because now you're more in an unstable environment. And then if the car's on its roof, how do we deal with that? Especially since patients are going to be in different positions compared to what we're used to. So... Sorry, now extrication, we are not actually extracting the patient from the car because this can be done very, I will say coarsely that you can move them around and pull them out, uh, which would actually cause more injuries. What we're doing is we're removing the car from around the patient with the end goal is to get the patient to EMS care without sustaining any more injuries than they had from the initial crash. Basically, we want to cause no more harm. That is our goal. And that is is where training, familiarization of our tools and tactics come into bear quite a bit. So one with training, when the planning sector, a lot of people say, well, we can't train, we don't have cars to cut up and you know, we, we can't do this or you know, there's a lot of stuff we don't have. But instead of focusing on what you don't have, you need to focus on what you do have. What we will do at the station is we'll go out and look at cars, like in the parking lot. Everyone drives a different car. So we'll go out, open the doors, look at how the hinges are, you know, how are the hinges structured, how the different structures of the dash are, where seat belts are, you know, how seat belts are like configured, how airbags are, where the airbags are located, and just kind of go through, okay, well, if we had to take off this door, where would we put our tools? What type of tactics would we use to do it? 
if we had to lift this dash, what would be the best way to displace the dash? And we'll just go through a bunch of hypotheticals, just looking at different people's cars saying, you know, what if, what if, you know, because honestly, that's the biggest thing in the fire service is what if, what if we have this confront us? What if we have this car that's on its roof? Now we'll throw in the fact, what if it's on fire? How do we handle all of this before we do our extrications? So there's a lot of, lot of just going through and studying and doing the what if game with your crew. Um, get time on your tools. Even if you're not actually cutting or spreading or having the tools touch the car, be familiar with the tools. You know, where are they kept on the truck? How do they operate? Like our heavy hydraulic tools, there's, there's a button that controls it to spread and to close. The button's different. If you just by feel, there's an indent on the button that makes it spread. So by working with the tools, even when we're not touching cars with the tools, we know we're able to know that tool well enough. I can operate the tool just by feel without actually having to look down and take my focus off of you know, where I have the tool placement to actually know which way to turn the switch to make it spread. This is some of the advanced level tactics. This is critical because if you don't know which way your tool goes the first time you touch the button, you're going to hurt the patient. So just take the tools off the truck, work with them. Um, there's lots of information out there uh, on the internet about different things. You can study YouTube videos, go to different websites, um, but be careful. I had a conversation with our state fire academy superintendent about the prevalence of social media and YouTube. And now anyone can put anything out there on any type of fire topic without any credentialing or any oversight and say, hey, here's what I know. And someone's going to say, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, make sure it's from credible sources like tool manufacturers. There are organizations, you know, NFPA is one organization, fire departments put things out, fire engineering is a good resource, but make sure you have a credible resource when you're looking at things online. Uh, another thing, especially looking at extrication, look on the websites of car manufacturers. There's always a good deal of information. A lot of them actually have sections for emergency responders. So that gives us another aspect of training when we don't have cars. When we do have cars, then it's time to train like we play. You know, we want to have things going through how we would as far as assignments, duties, and how we're going through things with the car. Um, we're not going through at full speed because we've slowed things down so we can see how everything reacts and also how we work together. A lot of it, a lot of training isn't just about knowing your tools, knowing the tactics. It's knowing your fellow firefighters. You know, there is, there's the guys I work with. When we get on a scene like this, we don't have to talk to each other. You know, if I go in with the spreaders and I move it, the minute I back out, they know I'm backing out because I want them to do something and the cutters will come right in. So we do a very efficient operation without ever having to talk with each other. That's because we train with each other. That's because we do things like go over vehicle construction with other. It's just the little things. So once we're trained up, we're ready to go. Um, the difference between a good department and a great department is when the guys come off the truck, we know you know exactly where you're going, what tools you're gonna take, what role you have. It's not a thing of, you know, you get off the truck and your officer's going, okay, you do this, you do this, now you do this. It's, we go off the truck, the officer does what he's doing, and we go what we know we're assigned to do. And this has to do, to do this, you have to pre-plan it. Either you have writing assign, you either have for every seat in the truck, if you're setting in that seat, those are your duties. You know, like in this graphic, you know, if you're setting in the driver's seat, you're the drivers. Well, he's responsible for logistics, which that just means getting all the tools ready. Um, if you're in the firefighter two spot, that means you're going to be doing all the cutting. And this is really, this type of layout is really prevalent, like in the volunteer fire service, 
where there's no one assigned to the specific duties that day, but when everyone shows up for the call, as soon as they jump in the truck, whatever seat they're setting in, they know this is why duties when I get to the scene because I am setting in this seat. Now, like on my department, as you'll see over here, this is our duty board from yesterday. So we have, you know, the rescue, our tower, our medic. So everyone knows what they're on. You know, Captain Host was our officer. Firefighter Yoder was the driver. Firefighter Wackerly had the spreaders if we had an accident. I had the cutters. Firefighter Haas had stabilization. So we knew what our duties were before we ever left the door. And we could kind of, when you, that's way when you get dispatched, you can kind of start thinking on your way to the call, okay, I know what my duties are. How am I going to apply them to this particular call? And that, that's really important to have your, be able to have your head in the game from the time you get called and get on the truck Till you get to the scene and actually get finished with the finish with the evolution um, always having our head in the game um, the bit the most important tool we take to any extrication is the tool that sets on our shoulders and that's our brain that's our knowledge so always have your head in the game and having pre-planned writing positions really helps you to focus in on that so we've looked at training we know what we're going to do what do we have to do? What do we have to do to execute these tactics? So well, we're going to need tools. And as you can see, there's a variety of different tools we can use. One thing I like about these pictures, if you look on every one, the tools are laid on a tarp. This is, these are both training evolutions, but this is exactly how an accident scene would look for us. The driver would lay out the tarp and the spreader and the cutters, those people would already have those tools, but the driver would be laying out all the other tools on the truck out on that tarp so they're ready to go as soon as either there was a malfunction with the tool we were using or we get into a situation where the tool we're using may not be the right tool that we have to go get something else. Instead of running back to the truck, they're already laid out on a tarp. The driver's pre-positioned everything for us and everything goes smoothly to transition from one tool to another. So we're going to look at the basic hand tools, power tools, air tools, hydraulic tools. Hand tools are basic and a lot of people, and I will admit, um, we have been, like in my department, we're spoiled by the fact we have heavy hydraulic tools um, because they do a lot of work and a lot of work well but sometimes we forget about the little tools we take, like for prying. You can use a Halligan bar, you can use a pry bar to pry open a little bit. Maybe that's what you, all you need to do to pry open a door, you know, as opposed to just like our go-to is always a heavy hydraulic spreader. Cutting, one thing that you'll be surprised, always have a good knife with you. I've talked to guys where that was the biggest tool they used on an extrication because they were cutting through upholstery, carpeting, headliners, you know, just light fabric, things that were in the way. And, you know, we talk about moving the big structure of the car, but a lot of times it's that we'll call it, we call it ginger red because it's just kind of dressing on the outside that we have to move that and get through that. And a lot of times a good knife is all you need to do that. You know, that's why it's always important carry a good knife with you, or at least in the tool cache, have a good knife to get through upholstery and things like that, that you may need to expose to see what you're cutting or working on or get that material out of the way so it doesn't jam up some of your other tools. You know, hacksaw is a good little tool to have to be able to do some more finer intricate cutting in compact areas. Axes, the one thing we use the axes for really is cutting the windshield, and that's about it. And that's even fallen by the wayside because we do have like our sawzalls and we have um, actual glass cutting saws. But if you don't have those tools, the axe is a good tool to cut a windshield to get it out of the way. Sockets and wrenches, you know, if you think about it, a lot of the things originally in extrication came from body shops and people that repaired cars. 
well, what does your mechanic use to take the car apart? They don't use hydraulic spreaders. They don't use hydraulic cutters. They use sockets and wrenches to take things apart. So if you don't have the heavy tools, you can take it apart old school like a mechanic does and use wrenches and sockets. Yes, it takes a little more time, but without the heavy tools, that's what you have to do and be proficient at. And if you become proficient at anything, the time keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller to execute a task. Um, along with that, screwdrivers. High lift jacks are a really cool tool that we used to use. As you can see, this picture here, this is a high lift jack being used to lift up a bus. There, it needs a little more base of support. That's why my foot's up against the base until it gets loaded. That's the one downside of a high lift jack is they're kind of unstable until they get loaded up. But one thing you can do, see there's this bar up at top. This is adjustable. You can flip that 90 degrees and you can use this to spread and use it to spread a door apart if you don't have you know hydraulic spreaders it's another option uh, the come along it takes chain or wire and you'll draw together to be able to pull we've used them to pull steering columns you know away from a driver so that be that's something that it uses to pull is another tool. Then we evolve from using the hand tools to power tools. Now power tools can be either plug-in, which means you have to have a generator or some power source on site, or what we've actually went to is we went to all, this is the back of our rescue, we've went to all battery tools. So, you know, we carry a bandsaw, a sawzall, a drill, which has an attachment to cut windshields, impact wrench, grinder. You know, and some of these things are going to be a low frequency use, but when you need a particular tool, sometimes that's the only tool that will do the job. Like the bandsaw is what we use for impalements. It's been a long time. I don't think we've done any, an actual accident with someone impaled. But through our training, we have found that to cause the least amount of additional injury, this is the best tool for the job should we ever need it. So that's why it's on our truck. You know, this is a Sawzall, it's got a cord. You know, so you never, once you have it plugged in, you're never going to run out of power. With a battery tool, you're going to run out of, the battery's going to go dead, which is why if you use battery tools, it's always important to have extra batteries available. Um, we've actually went our heavy hydraulic tools and all our battery tools use the same batteries. So we've carried quite a few batteries with us on the truck and we make sure they're charged every day. When the firefighter does his truck check, he goes and checks to make sure the batteries are fully charged. Again, daily truck checks, very important part of preparing and pre-planning for any extrication event, knowing that everything's on the truck, knowing that it's where it's supposed to be on the truck and it's ready to go to work. You know, those are the three things you need to make sure whenever you do a truck check in the mornings. Air tools, this is another set of tools that kind of came from us from the body and mechanics industry um, when we first started extrications. Air chisel is a very good tool for going through the skin of the the skin of cars, uh, buses, trucks, very good for cutting light metal. Using the right bit, these flat or half moon bits, you can actually cut some hinges with them. So if you don't have the cutters to remove a door, you can use an air chisel to actually cut the hinges, access the nader pin, cut the door away from the nader pin. You know, and also. We have airbags and impact wrenches that we can use as an air tool during our extrication process. Talk about our light hydraulics, which these would be your hydraulic jacks, which if they're made correctly, like these up here, um, you can set these, normally a jack works in the vertical direction. 
These jacks here can also be laid on their side and work in the horizontal direction, but not all jacks are like that. You need to know your tools. Um, these are labeled as far as how tall they are when the jack's not extended. This one's nine inches tall. And when it's fully extended, it's 17 and three quarters inches tall. So we can get, you know, almost eight inches, a little over eight inches of travel or eight inches of lift or spread. Then we'll go to the porta, porta power. Uh, we don't use these. I know a lot of people that have used them through the years. Um, it's a manual hydraulic pump that connects to various hydraulic tools. Like you have rams that will connect to it. So it's a manual ram. This little duck bill here that will spread. Um, I've seen this and actually I haven't used it in extrication, but I've used it in industry where I work where we need to move some heavy, you know, a fine movement of a heavy piece of equipment into position. But it is also applicable. I've talked to many people, many senior firefighters through the years when they first started, this was what they used for extrication because the hydraulic, the heavy hydraulic tools weren't available. They weren't um, something their departments could afford. So they use this. Um, it works like anything else. Once you have a tool and you know how to use it, it is very effective with any tool. So this is what most fire departments are using today. It's the heavy hydraulic tools. They run on hydraulic pressure that can is over 10,000 pounds. They have an extreme amount of pulling, pushing, cutting force that makes extrication very quick, very efficient. But again, you have to be a master of your tools and know what to expect as far as how it operates and also the type of reactions. You know, spreaders, they put, as you're spreading a piece of metal, there's a lot of energy you're storing into the metal until it releases. And that can be very violent, so you need to know where to, how to control that energy when it does release. Also, you're never, you can never fight a hydraulic tool. It will always win, which is why we never position ourselves between the tool and the car. I've seen people get pinched with the spreaders. They basically trap themselves in between the car and the tool when they were using it. So that's why we're always on the outside of the tool. So we're never trapped between the tool and the vehicle. That's one thing to always remember. And we also have to watch how these tools react and how they swing in, especially like when you work with a cutter and you'll see some, some of the little bit of the video that in tactics, when the cutter cuts, it will actually, the end will swing. So you need to know your tool well enough to know what direction that tool is going to swing. And is it going to go into the patient compartment? Is it going to contact my patient? So that's why training with the tools, knowing how they work is very important. Because once you push the button and these go, it's not going to stop till you let off the button. And then once you let off the button, a lot of the times the tools will set in place. So there's, these are excellent tools, but we have to respect the power they have, and we also have to be very skilled on how they are used. One thing that's kind of nice, you know, see, we have all these hydraulic tools laid out, but there's this gas power unit. So this power unit has to be on, which produces CO in the area, it's loud. We've actually changed over to a battery to run the hydraulic pumps. So the tools are now all self-contained that this whole system with the hydraulic pump and motor to run it is now all contained in the tool. It has a small hydraulic pump, a small hydraulic reservoir, um, and the motor is battery driven. Then the big change between going from battery to battery is the speed. Now we don't, 
we do not have to wait for these lines to be pressurized before the tool starts to move. As soon as we turn the handle or push the button, the tool is going to start to move. So as we transitioned, we needed to ourselves um, understand how our tool action changed. And one thing you'll notice, these cutters are open, these spreaders are closed. Whenever you're operating spreaders and cutters, or actually any tool, it needs to be in a position where it's ready to go to work. So a cutter always needs to be open to be able to go to work to go around a piece of material and cut. Spreaders always need to be kept close together so they can go into an area and spread. That's, that's one of the important things when you're working on a crash scene that your tools are always ready to go to work. For stabilization tools, this is wooden cribbing that we use under the cars. Uh, cribbing can also be plastic. Advantages, disadvantages to both. Wood is very common, easy to get, um, relatively inexpensive. But since it's a natural material and not engineered, the strength can be inconsistent and over time it will crack and degrade. And once your cribbing starts to crack, you need to replace it. Plastic, on the other hand, it's an engineered material. It is very consistent as far as its strength. Usually doesn't what doesn't have to um, is impacted by what is not impacted by weather. Um, the downside is it is expensive. It's a little heavier. So those are the give and takes with that, but it also lasts longer. So sometimes instead of buying three sets of wood crimming over the lifetime, you may only buy one set of plastic. So it's always give and take anything, with many things. Uh, step chocks are just pre-made blocks that are have different elevations to slide under the car to capture it. And then the struts are used on the sides when we have a vehicle on its side or a vehicle on its roof. <laughs> now we go looking at the structure of the car. We've got our tools. We know what we can use to work on this car. Now we need to understand about the car itself. So there are two main types of cars structures a unibody and a body on frame and a unibody which is probably about 90 percent of the cars out there today the frame and the body are one structure so the suspension and the engine bolts into the same structure that the body's on whereas a body on frame you have a separate frame here and then the suspension Bolt, the suspension in the engine bolts onto this frame, and then the body structure bolts onto the frame as well. The reason this is important to know is if you have a substantial crash that the connections between the body and the frame on a body on frame car may be compromised, you actually have to make sure you stabilize both the frame oops, and the body. Otherwise, you're not going to get the correct type of stabilization. So that's just one of the important things to know as far as stabilization, how you're gonna load path. Materials, you look at it, it used to be old cars are made with steel and people just said they're made of steel, it's a steel car. Today, there are so many different types of steels and advanced high strength steels. Um, that it can become very challenging. Many tools cannot cut some of the advanced strength steels. Uh, we actually had to get special cutters just to go through some of the, uh, what they'll call, a lot of times they'll call it boron steel because that's the type of material they use in the steel to make it stronger. But that was just the first generation of advanced high steels. Now there's, there's over a dozen different types of high strength steels. Um, all with higher and higher strengths. And it's to the point now that we're not actually cutting, when we're using our cutters, we're not actually cutting the steel, we're shattering it. 
we're putting so much stress on one point that it actually it's brittle enough that it actually just shatters as opposed to cut which means there's a lot of energy release and hence we need to know kind of understand the steel so as you can see in this car the blue is high strength the red is another another type of high strength steel and as you can see and we'll talk about a little more but the higher strength steels are where the passenger is going to be. Now back here, this is just the lighter mild steel that would be easier to cut. This is important to know if you can't cut like the A post or the B post or this area up here, maybe your tactic has to be, we'll cut to the patient and cut through the lighter steel in the back of the car since that's what our tools can handle. Aluminum, is a real big thing into cars now. If you look, this truck is all aluminum. The metal reacts a little different. The biggest thing on aluminum is going to be more like if it's involved in fire. It actually melts away fairly quickly compared to steel. Uh, magnesium is a fire issue. That has to be put out with dirt as opposed to water. If you put water on a magnesium fire, it just flares up and fuels it. Uh, if you look at this car, composites, like carbon fiber, uh, Kevlar, they're used in like this car has composite roof. So this is a carbon fiber roof, carbon fiber fenders. They're usually, like all technology, it always used to be seen on the very expensive, very high-end cars, you know, kind of like airbags. It used to be, you knew, okay, a, a inexpensive car was not going to have airbags. Today, an inexpensive car has as many airbags as a Bentley or a Rolls Royce. So as the technology increases, it filters down into areas that you used to never think that you'd see it. So that's why we always, we can't just look at a car and say, oh, well, that's an old or a cheap car. It's not going to have this. We always have to have a high level of suspicion that it could have any type of technology in it. So a little bit about anatomy, and this is important when you're going to do evolutions, that everyone's on the same page. So basically the first post here of the car, that's called the A-pillar. The middle post between the two cars, between the two doors is the B-pillar. Then the final back post is the C-pillar. Now we just keep going, if we have a big long SUV with more windows, then we'd have a D pillar and E pillar. We just keep going alphabetically front to rear to the car. The roof is, you know, that's a common thing. Everyone knows what the roof, but this edge underneath the door is called the rocker panel. That's a very heavy structure as far as being able to push off of it and use that to do a lot of our tactics. So these are kind of the th important areas of the car to know as we go through describing the tactics we're going to use. Doors are hollow. Now, as you can see on the outside, we have a steel skin. On the inside, you have plastic interior components. In the middle is high strength structure that's all interconnected. So we have, when we open a door, we're trying to force a door open what we're trying to do is defeat the, most of the time is defeat the lacking, locking mechanism. Sometimes it's defeating some structural damage that's occurred because of the crash. More often than not, we're having to fight the latching mechanism because you cannot just open the door. The mechanism has been damaged. So you can see here, here's the latch on the door. It's actually held in place by three bolts here. And this portion here, the pin that it latches to on the body frame, we call that the nader pin. So I'll be referencing the nader pin when we go through tactics. This is a very piece, the very strong piece of high strength steel, the nader pin. Uh, it's very difficult to cut. It can be cut, but always make sure that the doors attached to it when you cut the nader pin. I've seen it shoot off like a bullet if the, with the door not connected to it. So this is a very important thing to know as far as vehicle anatomy about where that nader pin and door latch are located. As you can see on the front door, it's usually about mid-level. 
you go to the rear doors, they're higher up. Like this one, I would say, is above the belt line of the way, above the belt line of the car. So it's higher up than the front latch here. So these are all things we kind of have to know about when we start doing our extrication. Also understand that, remember, these are held on with a couple bolts. This is all just light steel on the outside. So if we don't have heavy spreaders or cutters, we can use our saws, air chisels or whatever, strip the skin off to be able to get to the locking mechanism and defeat it manually from the inside if we have to. Knowing this is just all kind of flat steel that's stamped together, when we're using our heavy tools, sometimes we can start to peel things to peel the door apart until we get to our heavy structure. That's another reason we have to understand how the doors are built. Knowing we're going to peel some of the door away and when it starts to peel, we need to go to a different port of the door and spread some more to change where we basically have our bite on the door. So why it's important to understand how vehicles are um, constructed so we can better apply our tools. Construction allows us to know what we're going to attack. So as you can see, between the B post and the roof, it basically makes a nice roll hoop over the front seat passengers. Then the A post comes up and it also integrates in, it supports the dash, it supports the front structure that holds the suspension and engine, but this structure is also designed to deform and absorb energy in the event of a crash. So this will be very damaged and the whole part of that damage is to help absorb energy so the energy isn't transferred to the occupants. You see the dash structure. A lot of times this structure here needs to be displaced off of patients inside. And you can see with this one, it's basically connected at the A pillars and there's actually a support strut in the middle. This is important. I've, I've had it happen. Sometimes we get the dash going and it's going really well from the end that we can access. It doesn't go far enough because we can't, we didn't see the supporting structure in the middle or we just didn't have access to get to that supporting structure because we had patients on both sides of the dash. A lot of these panels, they used to be welded with the use of some of the new advanced materials. They're actually glued. This is a glue line of the adhesive that holds together the body on that aluminum truck that I showed you earlier. And if you'll see spot welds and bolts and rivets, those are often put there just to hold the panels together till the glue dries. So those may not, those bolts and rivets may not be the actual structural um, seam, but what's actually holding the panels together is the glue underneath. So kind of important to know how these structures are laid out, knowing what you're going to attack. But once we get this open here, we'll see we're going to attack the A post at the top of the A post and the bottom of the A post if we have to move the dash. Um, the B post, it's going to be very difficult when we go to remove that from the car. This is probably the strongest part of the car right here is the B post because it's keeping the car from crushing down on the heads of the occupants. We talked about that B post being strong. This is the cross section of a B post. I forget what kind of car this is out of. This is out of a Subaru or an Audi. But if you look at these things, there's two high strength steel tubes in this B post along with structural uh, flat steel, formed steel that's around it. Actually, this post here is more of a challenge to some of our cutters than this post. The reason, you can see here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven layers of steel, not including the steel bar. Cutters are like a big pair of scissors. And if you've ever taken a scissors and tried to cut a large stack of paper with it, the blades actually start to turn and they'll spread away from each other when those 
blades start to spread, they don't have the cutting force. This is what happens with our cutters when we're cutting some of these B posts. And this is a high strength A post. One thing I noted on all of these, none of these were cut by a spreaders. These were all, I mean, with the cutters. These were all cut with a saw because you can tell because all the posts are smooth and flat. If these were cut with the cutters, there would be a point on some of these, there would be a point right where you actually fractured the material because we're fracturing it as opposed to cutting. But you can see there's a lot of heavy material out there in some of these cars that we need to get through. That's why having, you know, not only cutters, but sawzalls, different types of saws, carbide tip saw blades will go through this, either a circular saw or a sawzall. And this is where, and I even had this issue with my departments, don't get cheap blades. You know, a lot of people think is, oh, I, I'll just put it, since we're going to use a lot of them, I'll just, I'll buy the cheapest blade I can. No, because you're going to go through a lot of those cheap blades and you're not going to make the progress that you need to. If you spend the extra money to get a little more expensive blade, those blades will actually go through this material and you won't go through a lot of blades, but you'll go through, you'll use one blade. So keep in mind, sometimes the cheapest way isn't always the best for what we want to accomplish. So glass, we have two types of glass in a car. We have laminated glass, which is a piece of glass that is sandwiched between two layers of plastic. You can see here on this, this is a windshield. Your windshields will always be laminated glass. Here in the corner, the glass is all pushed up. The glass is broken. There's shards of glass but it's still in one piece because it is captured between the two pieces of plastic. Some newer cars now have this type of glass on the side windows and rear windows as well. So where it used to be, we could use a punch to just shatter the side glasses. Now we actually have to cut side glass out just like we do a windshield. To get rid of this windshield, we have to use a saw, a sawzall to get rid of it or even an ax. Uh, for tempered glass, tempered safety glass, which is what's in the side and rear windows of cars, you can use a punch or a halogen tool, you know, the, the horn end of a halogen to shatter these. The key when you break the glass, and this is one issue when you do training, because I see it, we do it all the time, unfortunately. You break the glass and you push it into the car so you don't have to clean it up when you're done with training. When, when we train, we don't have people sitting inside the car, so it's not a big deal. When we're doing an actual extrication, there are people in here. We don't wanna push glass on top of them. So get in the habit, when you break the glass, try to get as much of it pulled outside the car as possible. And what happens with safety glass, as you can see here on the bottom here, the interior of this vehicle, it breaks up into little bits that aren't these long pointed shards. You basically get little cubes that will come out. So it, that's why it's called safety glass. You're really not going to cut yourself on the shards that are produced by safety glass because they're not, they don't have the sharp edges that you do from a normal glass that's not tempered like this. So in this, we usually always start when you break this glass, always go down to the very corner and then it will shatter the whole glass and then you can pull it out. One trick I like to use on the door glass is I roll the window down until I have just a little bit of glass sticking up. Then I'll take my punch in the corner and break the glass and most of the glass falls down into the door. Then I don't have to worry about keeping it off the patient or cleaning it up or having it in my area, it's still all inside the door. We wanna take the glass out on the side so we don't have it, so we control the glass as opposed if we didn't take it out and we started to do maneuvers to open the door, the glass could violently explode and go everywhere on us, the patient. So that's why we always break the side glass that where we're going to work so we control it. It also is usually the first way we access the patient. 
if it's a big crash, the gra glass will already be gone just by the design. The airbags will actually break the glass a lot of times. And talking about airbags, you know, we talked, it used to be these were only in fancy cars. Now, every car, every price range has airbags everywhere. And it used to be airbags were only in the steering wheel. Now, steering wheel, dash, side curtains, seats, knee, they're even in the seat belts, they're airbags. If we get in between these airbags, we're going to get injured if the airbag goes off during an extrication. The patient could get injured again. So we want to try to stay away, kind of what we call the zone. We want to give the airbag room so if something happens and it would go off again. We prevent, this is why we disconnect the 12 volt battery. We disconnect the battery so there's no power to the airbag system. But even after it's disconnected, there can be a time period where it's still live. So how do we know where these airbags are? Well, they're labeled. As you can see, this steering wheel says SRS, that's Supplemental Restraint System. Every place there's an airbag, there will be a tag to tell you just like this. This seat airbag, SRS airbag, on a little tag on the side of the seat. A side curtain airbag, this is on the B post, says SRS airbag. So you know there's a side curtain airbag. Again, why we need to carry good knives. This is a side curtain airbag that deployed. Well, it was in the way for us to get to the patient. We had to cut through the airbag and cut the supports of the airbag to get it out of the way. You know, if we were working on the patient's feet, we'd have to cut away the knee airbag in this vehicle or, you know, the seat airbag. There's a lot of stuff where just having that knife comes in very handy. But here's why, you know, I'll talk about what we call peel and peak. That's where you peel back the interior, the plastic interior to see what's underneath it. This is the A post on a car with a side curtain airbag. This is the inflation cylinder that inflates this airbag. This cylinder is hardened steel, but it also has pressurized air gas in it at 3,600 PSI. So you do not want to cut that. You can injure yourself, injure your patient, you'll break the tool. That's why we peel back the plastic. You can't see this in your car because there's a piece of plastic interior. One of the duties of the stabilization is to, once he's stabilized the car, start peeling back. So you peel this back and you see, oh, there's a gas cylinder here. You'll mark the outside of the car as where you're not supposed to cut it. I carry a small pry bar. I take that pry tool, I open up. If I see this right here and see this cylinder, I'll scratch the outside of the paint between here and here and put an X there. So the cutter person knows he cannot cut in this area because there's a gas cylinder. Gas cylinders are on the A post, the C post, in the trunk. I've seen them everywhere. So always peel out that plastic interior and look behind it. Also, it's something, it's another layer of material if we remove that plastic that our cutters don't have to go through and get bound up on. This is on a seat. This is an airbag cylinder on the seat. So they can be in many places. It's always important. Peel and peek behind all your interior before you cut. And Here's what it looks like when we deploy, the airbags are deployed. This was at a training. A lot of power, a lot of, now you see that they use a pyrotechnic charge to actually do the front. The side curtains are that compressed gas cylinder. So with the pyrotechnic charge for the front airbags and the dash and the steering wheel, there will be a little smoke but oftentimes what that is, it's not smoke, it's they use cornstarch or talcum powder in the bag so it slides on itself as it deploys. Now this one should be the seat bag. So see, that's, that's not smoke, that's actually just the powder that they put in the bag when they fold it up so that it won't stick on itself when it deploys.
So, but if all of these airbags deploys, there's a lot of, we'll say a little bit of smoke and a lot of dust in the air. So you'll have patients saying, I can't breathe. I have respiratory problems because all the airbags went off. So something to think about, maybe even if it just makes them feel better, oxygen, maybe just to help them out, even if it's just kind of to help their head think a little better. Um, but that's one thing to think about. We've got one more to see a different angle of that side airbag being deployed here. Now you can see if we were if we were in there trying to tend to a patient or just sticking our head through the window to evaluate a patient, we'd get injured if that airbag went off. And even if airbags don't go off, a lot of the systems today are smart. So they only deploy the airbags where they see a passenger. So they're looking for about 80 pounds on a seat before they'll deploy an airbag. So if there wasn't a patient in that seat, the computer didn't set off the airbags. But if the system isn't disarmed and the sensor may get the sensor may be jammed due to the collision, when you put your put a hand, put a knee on that seat and it senses 80 pounds, it could deploy the airbags on you. So that's why we really want to be, you know, disarm the 12 volt system. Some vehicles now are actually coming out with a key to turn off the airbags. Um, and then just be very aware of where the airbags are in that system so you keep yourself out of harm's way. The other bit of technology that's come in is hybrids. They're all over at every price range. So it used to be, again, a very expensive item on a car. Now they're coming down in price that it's a very common place on most car, a lot of cars. Um, hybrids use a gas motor, a gas engine, as well as an electric motor. The power for the electric motor are stored in high, um, high voltage battery packs that can range anywhere from 200 to 700 volts. And when these came out, there was all, I remember there's all sorts of, we'll say panic in the, some fire departments is like, oh my gosh, that, that there's this high voltage car now that how are we going to handle extrication? And honestly, to look at it, there's really nothing to be afraid of uh, with a hybrid car or an electric car when it comes to extrication. You know, I, I look at it like this. All the high voltage lines are orange. So anything in a car, if you see orange wires, it's a hybrid, it's a high voltage line. Don't cut it, you know, and that's the safest way to handle it. Just don't cut the high voltage lines. Doing our normal extrication, we don't go in and we don't cut the fuel lines, you know, one, because the fuel lines are placed where we're not going to be cutting it during our tactics. The same goes for the high voltage lines on a hybrid or electric car, as you can see, they're down the, the main volt, the main cables are down the middle of the car. This is out of where we're doing most of our work. So basically, don't cut the orange lines and carry on as a normal extrication and just be, be aware of any orange cables you may see. The one thing we really need to look out for is before we could walk up to a car and tell if it was running. We could hear the engine running. An electric hybrid can be silent, and as soon as the, the driver steps on the gas pedal, it'll take off because the electric motor will go as soon as he touches the gas pedal. So we don't know when we walk up to the car if the car's live or not. So some of the first things we do, since these are silent movers, we'll put wheel chocks around the wheel. And then the next thing we do for every, we've gotten in the habit of doing it for every car. 
This way we don't need to look around and see if there's labels on it to say, oh, is this a hydroid or not? It's just become our standard operating procedure for any vehicle is we make sure the car's in park, we put the emergency brake on, and especially with the key fobs, we removed the keys from the car. Um, a lot of times we have, we'll take them and put them in the engine. Um, if it's a standard key, we'll put that on the dash so we know it's there, that it's been disarmed. Um, if it's the key fob style, that usually goes with the officer in charge and then he'll often put that farther away in the truck so it's farther away from the vehicle. Another concern is fires with a hybrid or the battery. Um, this is really just recently, there was an incident um, in the US where this has kind of come back to the forefront of us, um, but it takes a lot of water. You can fight a battery, a hybrid electric car fire with water, but it takes a lot of water. This came right out of the Tesla emergency response guide, it says it could take 3,000 gallons or 11,000 liters of water to put out the battery fire in one of the cars. So that means if you're going and you think there's going to be a car fire with a battery car, bring a lot of water with you. Um, this is actually one thing we're using, I'm using to try to get our tanker replaced at my department because everyone doesn't think we need to bring a lot of water to high, you know, onto the highway. We need to bring a lot of water to the hydrate. And you can use dry chem if you need to, dry chemical works as well, but they're also known to rekindle. Especially, you know, I know in Europe, they actually, to fight the rekindle problem, they actually have a dumpster they carry with them on a truck that will respond to an electric vehicle fire and they basically submerge the car in the dumpster until they take it to the garage and it sets for quite a while um, so they know that the fire's out. So rekindles an issue so once it's out still be on guard to make sure it doesn't rekindle and keep, um, keep firefighting equipment ready. So here's one, you know, I talked about there is a lot of training on the internet. Here's a good one, especially if you want information about um, hybrid cars, electric cars. It's the NFPA on their website. You can actually have links to all the emergency rescue or emergency response guides for the uh, electric and hybrid cars that are out there. At one time we had that some of them are books. A lot of times they also have a one or two sheet quick reference guide that goes with it. I had a binder of quick reference guides for most of the hybrid cars that we had come across in our area in our rescue truck. So we could quickly, if we came across one, we could open up, we knew where the high voltage was, we knew where the 12 volt battery was, and we knew any other uh, special considerations we needed. How are we doing on time, Jose? We are at time. Okay, well, this is actually a really good thing, a really good place to stop then. And we'll talk about arriving on scene next week and then go into our tactics. All right. Thank you, Ed. Um, and thanks everybody for being here today and uh, joining us for this training. So we will continue the training next week. Um, if you have questions, you're welcome to stick around or drop those questions in the chat. Um, we'll make sure to either address them today or address them next week. Um, but thank you everybody for being here. Thanks Ed for an awesome training. Um, really appreciate it. Next week, Ed will continue on vehicle extrication and um, we look forward to seeing you then. I will drop the um, link for the evaluation into the chat and you can always access the um, additional training information on our um, website. So uh, Jose, I'll pass it off to you at this point. Thank you, Nancy. I truly appreciate it. Ed, thank you so much.
such heavy information. I was only I was nodding my head as if I, this was my first time in class. <laughs> we learned a lot, especially on the hybrid cars. Wow, I didn't know that we need about 11,000 uh, gallons of water <laughs> to put uh, 